We need to, we also need to have diversity of thought and perspective on our council, um, and that does require a younger voice and along with an older voice. We need a, we need the full spectrum of Durham residents represented on our council, um, and you know I think that's missing a little bit today, and I, ho- I hope to be a part of that voice. Um, I did want to speak to the gentrification question too, if we have time. Uh, but yeah, you know, definitely. I, I know go, I'm late. Go ahead. I don't take a month. No, go you ahead know, and take, I, take it now. Yeah, I think that you know Raleigh. I think Raleigh was just ranked number six fastest gentrifying city in the United States. Uh, Durham is certainly uh, not far behind. Um, most metro areas in the United States are experiencing gentrification at a, an alarmingly rapid pace, and and you know the displacement of people in Durham. We have 500 evictions a month. Uh, I would I would imagine the numbers are are similar in in Raleigh um, and in, in communities throughout the United States. The eviction crisis is real. The housing crisis is real, and it's an urgent issue. I think um, we we right now at least politically are engaged in somewhat of an ideological battle, and I think uh, in Durham specifically we need to focus on practical solutions to this issue. Um, and those do include uh, cr- providing affordable housing, but I think we need to think of it as a, as a part of a holistic economic development strategy because housing is only one piece of what makes someone's life affordable, right? People need to be able to live in safe communities and afford to live in a home and afford to get to work and have a job to go work on, have the ability to afford food, have, have those amenities close by so it's not, they're not encumbered by additional cost to go find food. So we, we, we can't think of affordable housing or this housing affordability in a silo, in my opinion. And right now in Durham, at least, much of the conversation is centered around housing, and we're neglecting the other pieces of the economic uh, equation that contribute to one's ability to afford their life, which ultimately is what we're trying to achieve, a city that's accessible and affordable for everybody, um, including housing, but beyond housing. And that actually raised, you actually raised an interesting question I want to hear from both of you. Because I am a mass transit person. I've stated this on this show several times, get around by the bus mm-hmm. system and things of that nature. Was a big fan, was really hoping that we were going to get light rail. Apparently, Duke University kind of killed that idea and everything. And the part of the reason I was a big fan was, like I said, I went and bought uh, the friends and family plan, and more friends than family, <laughs> in order to get to Wilson and in order to get to Winston-Salem this past week. Because I wanted to go down to National Black Theater Festival, and then I, we had auditions for the Road to the Apollo in Wilson. If we had light rail, that would have been no problem. I could have hopped on a train, maybe paid fifteen dollars, wouldn't have not had to worry about whether my friends were going to make it or not, and it would have been like he was. I mean, not knocking my friends, they got me to where I needed to get to, and that's a wonderful thing. But if there had been light rail, it might have been a whole different ball game. So I do know that that's something that a lot of people would like to see is kind of light rail. Of course, TDA is wonderful for getting to Raleigh. It's wonderful for getting to Chapel Hill, which I do every well, just about every Thursday on my way to Carborough. But you know. I would also like to get to Salar City uh, um, and some of the places uh, where Shakori Hill is and everything. There's no bus to Shakori mm-hmm. Hill. There's even buses that are hard to get to that are historical places here in Durham. I, I, would lo- I would love to be able to go to Stagville. Stagville is not an easy bus ride. I would love to be able to get to the museum that does the live music way out in the outskirts of Raleigh. Uh, um, Zaina, you'll know the one I'm thinking about. I just can't think of the name of it. But I know it's not an easy ride to get to. So, yeah. For both of you, what how would you what are your thoughts on light rail or just transportation in general, and what can we do to improve transportation for those like myself that are not fortunate enough to be able to have a car? Sure. Uh, can I? Yeah. So a, um, I am fully committed to whether I'm elected or not in the capacities that I serve currently to helping this community get a better public transit option. Um, I think just I think it's a, a couple points you made there that I wanted to point out about the light rail, uh, the failed light rail here in Durham. Right. Uh, you, you know there were a lot of questions, Mark, about the strategy in general. And if you remember, you've been here a long time, like I have. If you remember, initially we were hoping to get a light rail for the triangle, right, between Raleigh, Durham, right. and Chapel Hill. Right. Um, Raleigh decided or Wake County decided to say no. Most folks thought that that was going to kill the light rail because most of our ridership or commuting patterns trans- are between Wake and Durham County, right? Durham True. and Orange decided to partner together to, to access some federal funds to provide, to create a light rail between Durham and Orange. 
which was a cool idea, but honestly, Mark, it didn't. All those things you just outlined, it didn't address any of those. It didn't take us to the airport. It didn't take us to RTP. Even it didn't take us to Northern Durham. It didn't take us really anywhere uh, beyond getting us to UNC, the hospitals, right? Duke and UNC hospitals, and then NC, NCCU did have one stop on that light rail line. But the point I'm getting at is that it felt to me a bit like we were trying to force a square peg into a round hole and in and, and a $4 billion round, square peg into a round hole rather than really assessing the need and providing this community with a, a transit solution that actually works for us. Um, and, you know, I visited a few community that, communities that have deployed light rail, some to great success, but a lot um, at great expense and not uh, very effectively. So, um, it's worth noting that this past light rail plan wasn't really the best version of what we're looking for and, and really wasn't going to take you or me where we wanted to go, Mark, um, to be honest. You know, that to me was a big issue, right? It's like we want this, we want the community to, to go about $4 billion in on this thing, uh, which is too expensive, first of all, um, for something that's not going to really solve any of our problems. Most of our traffic, we sit on 40 and 147. Uh, the light rail didn't go in either of those corridors. Right, so it, in, in my opinion, it was really it really wasn't the best plan, and it wasn't executed well either. Uh, also, if you follow me close enough to know, you know I'm not a huge Duke fan, uh, even though I'm from Durham. But I must say that to the, to characterize it as though Duke killed light rail is a bit unfair. Um, there were some there were parties on all sides that could have managed it much better uh, throughout the process, and we could have actually delivered a transit solution for Durham. Uh, and I think we will. Uh, one of the things that I encourage you to look up, and anyone that's tuned into the show, Mark, is the concept of bus rapid transit. Uh, the chamber took a group of business leaders up to Richmond, uh, which is a community about the exact same size as Durham and demographically very similar as well. Um, and Richmond just recently deployed this bus rapid transit system, which cost about uh, a tenth of the cost of what it would have cost us to get light rail. And you can build it much faster, much cheaper, and it's much more effective uh, and moving people from place to place in a region of this size. Um, so I'm, I'm certainly going to be a- advocating that we, we look at bus rapid transit as sort of the next phase of public transit in Durham. Um, but to be clear, it's not just adding additional buses or lanes. It's, it's really a hybrid between a bus and a train, right? It's a dedicated, elevated track, so to speak, for a bus to move quicker through traffic um, and get us from place to place. Much more affordable than a light rail, um, both for the rider and for the taxpayer. So uh, I'm fully in on transit. I just don't think we had the right plan this time around, which I think we'll get it uh, with bus rapid transit and, and eventually some sort of rail system that hopefully connects us to Rockley because really the goal is to connect the whole triangle. Um, it's great to, to, to connect with our neighbors in Orange County, but we really need to connect the triangle, and Raleigh's a big part of that. And, Dana, if you're still on the call, I, I, I did kind of knock Duke just because that was kind of the narrative that a lot of people gave with light rail kind of went and on its last death nail. But Raleigh was definitely not on board when it originally came on board and everything. So where was your views on light rail and on public transit? Are we doing a good enough job in Raleigh? Because I remember I lived in Raleigh for a hot second, lived with a uh, young lady that I was staying with at the time. And I remember coming back home sometimes late. And some of the routes, they were even on major routes. Like they lived off of Wake Forest Road and um, the buses had stopped at 10, so I literally had to catch Capitol and then walk about maybe a two-mile route because Wake Forest is a major thoroughfare, but that route had stopped at 10. So I did know that sometimes even the buses in Raleigh would stop at earlier hours than you would think that they would have. Yeah. I know there was a lot of talk about, you know, Duke killing the light rail, but in my opinion, Raleigh killed it first. Um, in for the largest city in Wake County and in this region to not be on board for public transportation, it, I mean, it was a hindrance to the entire project. Um, we are, put bluntly, just very behind on public transportation. I know I remember growing up and hearing that we were going to get this um, – you know, public transportation was like flying cars. Like we're just, we're, it's coming, it's coming, it's coming, but it hasn't come yet, which means that whatever we've been doing, whatever we've been trying, is not working. And I think this points to exactly why we need new people in office, people who with different experiences with people, but also with more innovative ideas. Um, 
And, you know, if that comes from an older, younger generation, it comes. But it's clear that we are not moving in the direction of, you know, really prioritize that, not just for mobility. Um, it's Raleigh having one of the worst upper mobility rates in the country. They should be a top priority for us. Um, having people more mobile is going to increase um, people's economic opportunity. We are in the middle of a climate crisis. So that conversation around how public transportation plays an essential role in addressing our current climate crisis has been left out. And we're looking to bring that conversation back to the table, that we really don't have time to wait and that like we're going to have to have aggressive changes in not making us um, a car city anymore. Um, we understand that cars have kind of really, you know, ruled this city, but it's, it's really time for us to like really invest in like bike lanes, um, ride share opportunities. And like, you know, some cities are figuring out how to really use like data and technology to, you know, let people use both the bus, but then also maybe like a shared bike or a shared scooter or a ride share. Um, so we really just have to think about all the options, look at, you know, other innovative ideas, what other cities are doing, and then find a mode that works for Raleigh and the region. And I'm so cute. sorry. Um, I'm gonna, I'm actually, I'm going to have to jump off. Um, no problem. I have to get to another event. But um, thank you so much for having me, and it was a pleasure talking to all of you guys. And, um, yeah. Likewise. Please continue Likewise. this. Check out, thanks conversation. for calling. Check out, check out Bus Rapid Transit for Raleigh, too. Sounds good. Take care. Have a good night. All right. Good. Bye. Definitely appreciate you. And definitely appreciate you calling in, Zainab. And as you can tell, she's running for mayor of Raleigh. And right now, I think she's polling about third. So actually, as a Muslim sister, she's actually doing fairly strong. And we'll see how that turns out and everything. But she's definitely being very aggressive in her campaigning in terms of trying to be one of the uh, few Muslims that would be in a, uh, that kind of role and everything. Yeah, that's awesome. That's awesome. Big shout out to her, and, and uh, you know, fully support the movement she's 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 working on. So much respect. Yeah, uh, definitely. Now, one of the things I was going to bring both of you into the conversation because there's a mythology, and I'll have to get some of our Raleigh people to call in and everything later. But the other thing that I know is very important to you, and we've had people talk about it on this show, including a gentleman that's running for mayor. Don't know that Sylvester has that much of a chance, but he's running. But it's the issue of crime. Mm-hmm and the crime that goes on in the area. Now, I personally think that it's a myth that we always get the Durham crime covered a lot, and we know for a fact that there's as much, if not more, crime in Raleigh. But they don't get covered as badly as we do because the media, and I am part of the media, sometimes does a really wonderful job of highlighting what we've done, and the same thing can happen in Raleigh and Capitol Hill, and it doesn't get as much coverage, in my opinion. Right. Right. Uh, Yeah, you know, that... Growing up in Durham, that was always the issue, right? We felt like uh, we were unfairly unfairly characterized as the dangerous city in the triangle, right? Um, and, 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 and quite honestly, a lot of that is, is racially motivated. Right? And you know that. I'm not saying anything you don't know. Uh, but, you know, while there's a beautiful and, rich, and, and, beautiful and amazing black community in Raleigh, Durham has just historically been positioned as the black city in the triangle. So with that comes... Um, all of the unfair biases uh, with that characterization. And I think for me growing up in Durham, I wore it as a badge of honor, right? We, we, those of us who are from here, we sort of, we sort of started to say, you, know, hey, you, you don't, you don't want to come here, we don't come here, we're proud of this community and we love it. Um, but that's not to say that we don't have an issue, at least in 2019 specifically, we are having an issue with crime in our city this year. And there, is some, there has been a significant uptick in crime specifically violent crime in Durham, I think about a 20% increase, um, if I have my numbers correct, uh, year over year. So we should, we should be alarmed, and I think our murder rate is almost double year over year. Um, so we are having, we are experiencing a crime wave in Durham, one that uh, we need to address. And, and the people that are dying in our city are black and brown people, mostly uh, black males in the city. So it, it, it is an issue for us. I hear what you're saying about the rapid down comparison. I'm very sensitive. But um, the clients, we, we, we can't ignore this, this scale of murder, you know what I mean? Yeah. 
Yeah, so we definitely have to have issues to deal with that. And I know part of what people have talked about is the fact that we might need to do more with the relationship between the police and the larger community 